Hey everyone, it's Kenji. We're going to make some ragu bolognese. Bolognese. So this is not the first time I've done a video on this, um, but this is the simplest version I'm going to make. I have another video on here on my channel that's based off the recipe um, that's in my book and on Serious Eats, which is a sort of very complex ragu bolognese that, um, you know, some people would call inauthentic or a non-traditional which it is, but it's also delicious. Um, but this version we're gonna make today is a much simpler, um, definitely more sort of traditional version like you would see in Bologna. Um, so we're gonna start with a wide pan. Um, you can also use a Dutch oven if you want, but a wide pan, a little bit of olive oil, not too much, maybe a couple tablespoons. Um, and then I've got here um, about four to six ounces or so of um, pancetta. Um, this is pretty optional, you know, you could use salt pork if you want, if you had guanciale you could use that. Um, you could also just completely leave this out and it would still taste fine. Um, but I like having a little bit of pancetta in here for the flavor. Um, and this is pancetta that I basically, you know, you can buy this, the ends of pancetta that have been chopped up like this at the supermarket, or at least in the regular supermarket I shop at you can. Um, and that's not like a, it's not like a specialty Italian store or anything, it's just like a safe way. Um, but certainly you can go to a specialty Italian store and ask, uh, Ask the guy at the counter, at the uh, deli counter, if you could have the ends of the pancetta. Um, you could also use the ends of the prosciutto. Um, or you can buy, you know, you can buy uh, sliced pancetta or thick cut pancetta and chop it up yourself. So we're just gonna let that brown a little bit. I got it over pretty high heat. Okay. So ragu bolognese comes from Northern Italy. Um, my, my cousin actually lives in Bologna um, and if you go to Bologna, what you'll find is that virtually every single restaurant in Bologna um, will serve their version of ragu bolognese, served with either a tagliatelle or, um, you know, like a wide fresh pasta or in, or in the form of a lasagna. Um, and virtually every restaurant will also have their own, own form of uh, tortellini and brodo, similar to ravioli, but a little sort of like a little different shape um, with, um, in, a, in a broth like a clear chicken broth. That's, those are the sort of two classic dishes in Bologna. That and of course, charcuterie, like Bolo uh, mortadella. You know, what we call bologna in the US, that's based off of mortadella, which is a emulsified sausage with chunks of fat. All right, so my pancetta, I can hear it. Initially it was giving, doing like a sort of sound, like a, the sound of, a, of moisture evaporating and eventually turns into more of like a crackly sound. And that's the sound that indicates that all the moisture has been driven off and now we're in the process of really frying and browning. So you can, you want to keep your senses open while you're cooking. All right, so our pancetta is brown. We got some nice flavor there. Um, so in goes, I am using a combination of uh, beef, that's this guy, lamb and pork. Um, but you don't need to use those. Uh, you could use all beef, you could use a combination of beef and pork. Um, ideally, if you had access to veal, ground veal, you would use some ground veal in this mixture because it um, lends some gelatin and tenderness and richness to the sauce. Um, but uh, we don't have, I don't have any veal. I don't, the markets around me don't sell it. I could go to a specialty butcher, but I very rarely go to, you know, go out of my way to buy special ingredients. I usually just shop at the regular supermarket. Um, and so I don't have any ground veal, but it's okay. I'll show you what we can do instead. Um, I like using lamb in my ragu because it, add some flavor, but definitely not something that's necessary, not something that is by any means uh, common or, or traditional, but um, I like doing it because it tastes good. So this that was a half pound each of uh, pork, beef, and lamb. And by the way, I will link to, um, either I'll link to a recipe, I, you know, my friend Daniel Gritzer has a version of bolognese on Serious Eats that's pretty similar to this one, you know, very classic. Um, and if that one's close enough to what I'm making here, I'll just link there and note what I've made changes for. Otherwise, I'll rewrite the recipe uh, in the comments, so look below. All right, so we're just gonna let that brown a bit. You don't have to break it up too much at this point. We wanna let it brown a little bit. Keep our stove clean. Uh, meanwhile, we're gonna take the vegetables. Um, I actually had already, I made another batch of this earlier today and turned it into a lasagna so that we could eat it later in the week. Um, so I actually already um, had some leftover carrots that I've chopped, but otherwise we're gonna um, our vegetables are going to be very basic, um, you know, Western European mirepoix, um, or, in, or in, as they call it in uh, Italian, so, a sofrito. So um, carrots, onions, celery, um, and the ratio I use is about 
About three parts onion, two parts celery, one part carrot. Um, you can adjust that according to your own taste. You know, if you really love onions, do more. Um, if you want something more, you know, more vegetal and less sweet, more celery. And if you want to maximize that sweetness, then more carrot. It's really, it's really up to you. Um, I just happen to like that ratio, but I, but I eyeball it. And I also, you know, it depends on what ingredients I have uh, at any given moment. Um, so those are some baby carrots that we actually pulled from our neighbor's garden, or my daughter pulled from our neighbor's garden. So I will repay that favor, repay those carrots by giving them some, some of this ragu when I'm done with it. So we're looking for a pretty fine dice on here. So it all kind of melts in the sauce. Oh, I also got some fresh garlic there. For celery, trim off the ends, cut it into segments cut lengthwise into strips like that okay and then rotate Kind of cross. The process for you know mincing and dicing virtually any vegetable is the same. You want to basically just decide what size you want to do it and then cut it across each of its axes um, at that size and then you end up with dice that you know depending on the geometry of the vegetable is not going to be perfectly evenly shaped but at least you know that um, there's nothing that's going to be too big or too small and it's all going to be roughly the right size. And that's true, yeah, for virtually any vegetable I can think of. I'm sure someone in the comments will come up with a, uh, a counterexample. But if you, if you want to know how to cut a vegetable, ask, and I'll try and respond to you in a future video. Similar with an onion, we're going to cut in. Um, and when we're cutting an onion, we do want to, at least I do, want to aim for the golden ratio. So imagine this is one. You're aiming for a point about 1.6 or 1.7 below the onion and aiming your knife towards that. And that mathematically, according to the model my friend made, is gonna give you uh, the most even dice size when you then uh, cut across it. Um, and you do need to make those horizontal cuts. I mean, you don't need to, but making the horizontal cuts will result in a more even uh, dice size, despite what anyone might tell you. Mathematical models will show it. All right, so I can hear this browning now, so I'm gonna give it another stir. Oop. Put that back in the pan. Um, people ask me how I keep my stove top clean. Uh, the answer is I just clean it after each use. Um, I, at the very least, I give it a good wipe down with a damp towel. Um, and most of the time, you know, if there's any kind of oil splatter, which I'm sure there's going to be today because we're going to be simmering a sauce and frying meat and whatnot, um, I will uh, take out the grates and spray it down with some Formula 409 and uh, give it a once over with a sponge and then I dry it with a towel and that's how I clean it. Um, if there's really like caked on gunk, you know, like if I've had a, like if I spilled milk into there and uh, I got milk like into the, um, <laughs> under the grates onto the and it, and it really burned on to the uh, the stainless steel there what I'll do is I'll use some uh, barkeepers friend which is the same thing I use to keep my stainless steel clean uh, but it's it's a product made with oxalic acid it's a powder you want the powder kind not the uh, not the uh, liquid kind and uh, that's how I keep my stove sparkling all right so you see I'm breaking up the meat like this um, if you're impatient about using a wooden spoon, a good tool to use, well, you can use a potato masher, but I prefer even using uh, a pastry cutter. One of these guys here. See, it's got blades. It's made for cutting butter into um, flour for making pie crusts and whatnot, but uh, it's really good at breaking up meat in a pan. So if you're making like a, you know, a very rough tomato sauce and you have a can of whole peeled tomatoes, this is also a good tool for breaking up those whole peeled tomatoes if you don't want to Get your fingertips dirty. See? Does the work of 
five wooden spoons at once. So here we're looking for relatively brown. You know, when you brown ground meat like this, there's always a trade-off. Um, the more you brown it, the more flavor you get. Um, but even ground meat can sort of get kind of dry and uh, crumbly when you uh, make it into a sauce. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off. You, you can decide for yourself how much you want to brown it. Um, you know, there are ways to work around that. You know, some people, what they'll do is they'll uh, brown it as a whole patty. So you get a lot of really nice dark brown surface and then you break it up so that the meat inside is still tender. Um, so there, there are ways you can sort of game the system. But if you're just being a you know casual, making a casual bolognese um, or chili, you know, ground beef chili or whatever, you don't have to worry about it too much. Just let it brown an amount. Um, and I'm gonna season with salt, season with pepper, black pepper. And once our meat is brown the way we like it, I'm gonna go in with my vegetables. Might be more onion than we need, but well, whatever. I like onion. You might notice, you know, some people might notice that I'm going in with my onion and garlic at the same time. And and if you you know if you've been a long time follower of say Cooks Illustrated or even serious eats or saving some of my stuff um you've probably heard red in places that well you know onion cooks slower than garlic does so you want to add your garlic at some point after you add your onion so that it doesn't uh burn um this is true you know if you're cooking just onion on its own uh it'll take longer to cook than if you're cooking just garlic on its own um but the reason for that is because onion has a higher moisture content um and so the onion will you know, it takes a little bit longer for that moisture to evaporate. And as long as there's moisture in a pan or in something that you're sauteing, um, the temperature sort of self-regulates because um, the heat basically sort of selectively gets used to evaporate moisture as opposed to um, raising temperature and beginning those browning reactions. So, it, you know, this is very roughly true, not exactly true. So, uh, you know, if you're, a, if you're a physicist who uh, wants to argue about this, um, go for it. But um, the general rule is that until most moisture has been driven off, you're not really going to get any browning of anything because the reaction, you know, the reaction, the Maillard browning reactions take place at higher temperatures than uh, the boiling point of water. So the idea is that because your onions are in there, your celery and carrots are also in there um, and regulating the temperature of the contents of this pan to, rel you know, to not all the way below 212 degrees or Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, but a little bit below that. Um, until all the moisture from those vegetables has evaporated, you're not really gonna get any hotter and therefore you're not gonna get too much browning. Oop, I think that was my, uh, <laughs> one of my GoPros overheated. So you might've just lost the top view. We'll let it cool down. You know what I should do is I should turn on the uh, fan. I guess I forgot that heat travels up there. All right, well, we'll, we'll rely on my head cam view for now. That was just a little experiment that failed. Um, all right, so our vegetables, Getting pretty soft. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna chop up a little bit of sage and sage and parsley. Um, optional ingredients, uh, you don't have to add these. You know, one nice way to do this uh, bolognese is to tie a sprig of rosemary up with a string, a few sprigs of rosemary up with a string and throw that in there while you're sauteing everything. Um, you could also do the same with um, some thyme sprigs, uh, you know, you don't have to add any herb at all, but um, if you want to sort of add a little bit of layer, a little layer of something to here that's gonna um, increase the flavor, herbs is a good idea. Um, so we're gonna use a little bit of sage and parsley, mainly because that's what I had. So to chop herbs, pick the leaves, bundle them up like this. Chop, 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 chop. 
Um, so people might ask me which version of Bolognese is better, you know, this one, this sort of simpler one, or the more complex one that I have in my, you know, my book or on Serious Eats. You know, the more complex one, it includes uh, chicken livers. We do a few other things to it that um, we, we saute the vegetables separately. There's a, there's a few steps you do that um, alter the final dish. Um, I wouldn't say either one is better. The other one is more work. I think you, you know, in, in the long run, you develop a little more flavor and you sort of develop cleaner flavors. Um, but you know, this is a it can it can be a rustic dish. Um, it often is. Uh, so it's really up to you how much uh, which recipe you, you want to look at and, and which elements you want to take from each recipe. There's no real better or worse. It's really just a matter of what speaks to you. Okay, so I'm going in with my herbs. Now that our vegetables are softened. And you see, this actually doesn't really take much time at all. I think I've taken maybe 15 minutes so far. Um, just by the way, I'm gonna prep some. Oh, so we don't have veal. So what veal adds to it is gelatin. Um, we don't have veal, so instead, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some chicken stock, and I'm just gonna add a little powdered gelatin to it. So that's a couple cups of chicken stock, a few tablespoons of powdered gelatin that I'm sprinkling over the top. Just let it sit there and hydrate. Um, if you have homemade chicken stock that's super gelatinous, you could even skip that and just use your chicken stock. Or if you have veal stock, even better, that's gonna be super gelatinous. Um, and then I'm going in with some tomato paste. This is double concentrated tomato paste, so I'm using maybe two tablespoons or so. Uh, if you were using regular tomato paste, you could use a quarter cup. Um, but of course, eyeball it. If you want more tomato, use more tomato. If you want less, use less. Um, you can also add tomato puree, or canned peeled tomatoes, or passata, something like that. Um, but, you know, depending on how much you like tomatoes and how tomato you want your sauce. But in general, you know, ragu bolognese is a meat sauce. It's not a, it's not a tomato sauce with meat. It's a meat sauce with a little bit of tomato. Um, so don't, you know, do your well, use as much tomato as you want. But uh, typically in a bolognese, you wouldn't really go overboard with the tomatoes. All right, so I think we're good there. All right, so now you see all that brown stuff on the bottom of the pan right there. We want to get that stuff off and into our sauce because that all has flavor. Um, so the way we're going to do that is we're going to deglaze. Um, and we're using some white wine, Pinot Grigio from a box. You don't need the fancy stuff first. All you want to make sure is that you have a dry wine. It doesn't matter if it's white or red. Either one will work. Adding maybe a cup or so. And then we're just gonna use a wooden spoon to scrape. The reason you want a wooden spoon for this is because a wooden spoon is stiff, so it lets you scrape pretty hard, but it's also a little bit malleable. So if you tried to do this with a metal spoon, of course, um, you'd find that you'd gouge your pan or you'd find little uh, imperfections in the surface of your pan that your spatula gets caught in. So a wooden spoon kind of conforms to the shape of your pan. Um, it also allows you to get into the corners you know, conforms to the shape of the corners of your pan. Of your pan. Um, so, you know, an, a silicone spatula would be too weak for this. A metal spatula would be too strong. A wooden spoon is kind of like the, um, you know, the Goldilocks, the, the baby bear implement. All right, so we added our wine. We cooked it until it's basically dry to get rid of the excess alcohol. Now we're gonna add our last two ingredients here. I think they're the last two, they might not be. Some milk. So a cup of milk. And finally, that stock with the gelatin added. And there we go. So the reason we're using a wide pan, by the way, um, a wide pan encourages more evaporation. So that's gonna speed up the process of um, browning, heating and browning the meat and the vegetables. Um, it's also gonna encourage this to um, reduce uh, without having to boil it very, very hard um, and without taking it too long. So the general rule of thumb is that the wider your pan, uh, the more steam is gonna come off the surface uh, the, and the faster it's going to reduce. Um, given, a, given a set, you know, a, a given a set of ingredients, the same set of ingredients um, and the same sort of boiling level. So we're gonna keep this at a, at a very bare simmer um, and let it go. Uh, and that's gonna reduce it relatively quickly. It'll probably take an hour and a half or so, maybe an hour. Um, if we were doing this in a taller pan, like a Dutch oven or something, uh, because there's less surface area, at a simmer, it would take longer to reduce. It would take probably two to three hours. Um, 
you can do it either way. It's just one takes longer than the other. Uh, and of course there is, um, as with any stew, you know, whether it's chunks of meat, whether it's like an American beef stew or bouffe bourguignon or any, any kind of stew, uh, the longer you cook it, the, you know, there is, the longer you cook it, the more tender the meat is going to become initially. Uh, but there is a limit to that, and eventually the meat fibers are going to completely break down so they can't hold any moisture at all, uh, and you're going to end up with a sort of dry, a stew that's simultaneously wet and tender, but also kind of tastes dry and leaves sort of chalky bits of meat in your mouth. So there is such a thing as overcooking when it comes to any kind of ragu, whether it's bolognese or chili or whatever. Um, so we're going to let this come to a simmer. That's it. Now I'll reduce it down to... That's what I'm looking for right there. Just a very bare simmer. Um, and I will come back and see you. Um, I'm going to go have lunch with my wife uh, and I'll see you after that. All right. So I'll be back in a couple hours. All right. So it took a little bit longer. Sorry, lunch took a little bit longer. Um, but I don't know. You might have seen my hand and I, all I did was come home and uh, give it a few stirs. But you can see how much it's reduced um, and how you might have watched, if, if you watch closely on the time lapse video, um, assuming the time lapse video worked, um, you probably see the fat break out. Um, as it cooks and then as it thickens, as, as it reduces and that gelatin thickens and all the protein from the meat starts to thicken everything, the fat will emulsify back in. And so you end up with a sauce that doesn't look greasy, even though at some point in the process it did. Um, so if your bolognese ever looks greasy, uh, just let it reduce and it, the, uh, the greasiness will go away. Of course, if you don't want the fat in there, which I don't understand why you wouldn't for a dish like this, um, you can always skim it off, but that is done. Um, I've had some pasta cooking on the side here. This is just some rigatoni. I don't have any fresh pasta right now, but I basically I just cooked this because I wanted to show you uh, show you what we got. So I'm gonna take that pasta. I'm gonna put it into a skillet. Um, I didn't cook it in a ton of boiling water. I cooked it in just enough boiling water. Um, and you can see how concentrated and starchy that water is now, which is what we want. Because that is what's going to help the sauce emulsify. So when you're finishing this dish, you know, you can make it into a lasagna. You can toss it with fresh tagliatelle, something like that. Um, I'm just using some uh, dry rigatoni, which uh, I, I got the, you know, the stuff that comes with, um, you know, cut with bronze dyes. So this is the... Um, I can't remember Berea or the, the Berea Collezione version or the or the Decheco, you know, one of those supermarket brands, but like they're not the nicer ones um, that uh, has a bit more texture to the pasta, um, cut on a bronze die as opposed to um, a Teflon die, so that you get a little bit more surface area for clinging. All right, so we're gonna add some ladles full ladles full of sauce. Uh, a little bit of sauce to the pasta and, then a, and a little bit of pasta water. And that starchy pasta water is going to help the sauce cling to the... Uh, sorry, the pasta cling to the sauce. And this takes me right back to my... One of my earliest restaurant jobs, which was working in a sort of fine dining northern Italian restaurant. And I was on the pasta station and I cooked a heck of a lot of pasta bolognese in the, uh, in the uh, winter months. But yeah, whatever whatever pasta you choose, you're looking for something that's kind of hearty. Um, so a rigatoni like this with ridges, um, things that will capture that meat and that thick sauce, um, or fresh thick pasta, either pappardelle or tagliatelle. You can make it yourself, um, or you could uh, you know buy it fresh. Um, I'll leave a link uh, to a recipe for fresh pasta and instructions for fresh pasta in series heats. Um, if you do feel like making, making fresh pasta yourself, I will probably make fresh pasta for the rest of this. Um, one of the things that's great of bolognese, by the way, it uh, improves in the fridge. So take this, put it into a container, throw it in the fridge. Um, it'll improve over a couple nights um, on the reheat. So that gives you plenty of time to make it ahead. All right, so finally I'm gonna add, garnish it with um, a bit of basil and parsley. Quite rough on the chop there. You see how nice and creamy it gets when you emulsify it with that, uh... oh, let's move this over here. When you emulsify it with that pasta sauce. All right. And then shut this down to low.
Add some Parmesan cheese. A little fresh olive oil for the flavor. We'll give it a toss. And there we go. Look at that. You see how everything coats the pasta nice and creamy, perfectly emulsified, delicious. be for you guys. Oop, there you go. Sit. Oop. Got it. <laughs> She'll get it eventually. All right. Finish it off a little fresh parmesan. Boy, oh boy. Classic, simple, delectable treat. Pasta bolognese. Hmm. That is, this is like the taste of winter for me. Mm. <laughs> All right, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, pasta bolognese, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.